All right, hello everyone. Thank you for making the time to attend the student lecture series today. I am Li Yun, a dentistry student at the University of Bristol and I'll be starting year two this September. So I know that um, most of you should be taking IBs or A-levels, but for me, I took the Singapore Polytechnic Diploma in Biomedical Science. So it was a rather unconventional route from Polytechnic to University. During my Polytechnic days, I developed interest in medicine as I found it to be applicable in day-to-day -day life because I was able to understand um, and learn about diseases and body functions. However, um, after some time, I found medicine to be rather general. And this was where I came to learn about dentistry as a career. So I realized that dentistry aligns with many of my academic interests and it is also a niche area on its own. Um, aside from that, it is also a pragmatic career because it is financially stable and it also provides more flexibility for work-life balance. So after all these considerations, I decided to pursue dentistry as my future career. So for today, I'll be sharing mainly on the work that dentists do in terms of clinical and interpersonal skills. And I also will be touching a bit on my experience studying dentistry in Bristol and also some information uh, for applying dentistry. For the work that dentists do, it, it mainly involves um, clinical and interpersonal skills. Uh, for clinical skills, I'll be sharing on case studies, which uh, will link anatomy and oral health diseases and also some of the common treatment options available. As dentists, it is important for us to understand that um, oral health conditions can affect many different parts of our body so that we'll be able to provide a more holistic treatment for the patient that will also help to improve their overall health. Apart from uh, clinical skills, interpersonal skills are also another very important aspect. Because for dentists, we have to recognize that Patients, like um, any one of us, have our individual needs and concerns. And it's also common that patients um, are anxious when visiting a dental clinic. So interpersonal skills such as communication and teamwork will really help to manage the patient's anxiety and also provide them with a more uh, smooth and comfortable treatment experience. So I'll first be sharing on clinical skills in terms of the um, clinical case studies. Before I go on to share about the clinical case studies, let me first introduce to all of you some of the common clinical terms that dentists use. So C slash O stands for what the patient complains of. That is the patient's chief complaint when visiting the dentist. HPC stands for the history of presenting complaint. So it's usually the symptoms that the patient may have felt over a period of time. Extraoral or EO examination for short is the examination of the soft tissues outside the mouth. So usually around the area of the head and neck. Intraoral or IO examination for short is the examination inside the mouth. So it's around the hard tissues such as the teeth and the soft tissues like the tongue and gums. Now that we have a better understanding of some of the clinical terms, let us um, talk more about the case studies. Okay, so this is the first case study. Freddy, a 50-year-old male patient, visits the dental clinic one day. So he complains to the dentist that his teeth has been wearing away and he also has a feeling of halitosis, which is bad breath, and a burning sensation. He also lets the dentist know that over the past few years, his teeth have started to feel sharp and he has noticed some of his teeth are beginning to chip and feel thin. Not only that, he also has a feeling of heartburn, which I will go on to discuss um, and explain in the next slide. So for the social history of Freddy, um, he consumes acidic food and fruits and also fizzy drinks on most days of the week. Let us look at this image on the bottom left. So we can see that the esophagus, otherwise known as the gullet, is situated right above the stomach 
and it leads into the stomach. So in between is this ring of muscle known as the gastroesophageal sphincter. Normally, this ring of muscle opens to let food into the stomach and it then closes to stop stomach acid from the stomach from leaking back up into the gullet. So as we understand, the patient has um, heartburn, which is an uncomfortable burning sensation in the gullet. This is usually caused by gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GORD for short. This is a condition where acid from the stomach leaks up into the gullet. And this is because the ring of muscle um, at the bottom of the gullet has become weakened. So now let's look at this image at the top. We can see where the arrow pointing to, that's the ring of muscle at the bottom of the gullet. So it has become weakened and this allows some of the stomach acid to flow back up into the gullet. Because of this acid reflux, it usually produces heartburn, which would explain why the patient has this uncomfortable burning sensation in his gullet. On further intraoral examination, which is um, the examination inside the mouth, the dentist finds out that the patient has, uh, yeah, the patient Freddy has tooth wear of the incisal edges on his upper and lower front teeth, as we can see on this image on the left. So it's around this area. And the dentist also finds out that Freddy has tooth wear of the occlusal or biting surfaces of his teeth which can be seen from this image on the right. This, is, um, this tooth wear is due to the stomach acid that has refluxed into the gullet and then enters his mouth. So this causes tooth erosion, which has been presented in these images and the clinical findings. Because of the acid reflux that enters his mouth, it also causes halitosis, bad breath, and burning sensation in Freddy's mouth. Which, was, um, which were the complaints that he mentioned to the dentist. In summary, uh, Freddy's condition of gastroesophageal reflux disease, GORD, causes acid reflux from his stomach to the gullet because of his weakened ring, ring of muscle in the gullet. And when this acid enters his mouth, it causes tooth erosion, where his teeth start to wear away. To treat gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, it requires collaborative medical and dental management. So the dentist um, can provide amoprazole, a type of proton pump inhibitor that's a medication for Freddy. This can help to decrease acid production in stomach and also help to relieve his heartburn symptoms associated with acid reflux. The dentist can also advise Freddy to use a soft toothbrush and also a low abrasive toothpaste, such as those toothpastes without microbeads in them. The dentist will also recommend Freddy to use a mouthwash so that he can combat his bad breath and will also monitor his tooth wear by um, asking Freddy to come in for regular dental visits. On Freddy's part, um, he should reduce his acid intake and frequency since he likes to frequently consume acidic food and fizzy drinks. So for instance, um, he likes to consume oranges, which are acidic fruits, and he can substitute those with less acidic fruits, such as melons. Because erosive tooth wear can be worsened by abrasive food habits, such as aggressive chewing, and also the acids in his diet, so Freddie has to make sure that he reduces his acid consumption so that he can help to elevate his symptoms of GORD. Now let's move on to the second case study. Jane, a 68-year-old female, um, visits a dentist one day and he complains to the dentist that she has pain and stiffness in her jaw. And the dentist also finds out that Jane likes to crack and chew on nuts. On extra oral examination, that is the examination outside the mouth, the dentist finds out that Jane has pain on her TMJ and also some opening, click and popping sound, 
we will go into more detail of the extra oral examination in the next few slides. So on the previous slide, we have seen the term TMJ. So what is TMJ? TMJ stands for temporal mandibular joint. It is a joint that connects the lower mandible, the jawbone, and the scalp. This joint also helps to open and close our mouths. So this joint is located somewhere here, and you can feel. So it's somewhere around your jawbone and your skull, as you can see in, um, on this image on the right. And also here, to see that it's in this area where it helps to close and open our mouths. So on further extra oral examination, um, let's first talk about the parts of the temporal mandibular joint so that we can get a better understanding before we discuss more about the extra oral examination. So to help orientate ourselves, D is the front while E is towards the back of our head. So for part A, this is the condyle, which is the rounded area at the back of the jaw. B at the top, is the mandibular fossa, which is the depression in the jawbone or the mandible. C, which sits in between the condyle and the depression in the jawbone, is the intraarticular disc. D at the front is the articular tubercle, which is a raised bone on the sides of the skull. E is the external auditory meatus, otherwise known as the ear canal which is the space that leads from our ear to the eardrums. So the condyle A forms a joint with the uh, mandibular fossa, that is the depression in the jawbone. Now let's look at this image at the bottom. So let's focus on the image on the left first, which shows that when our mouth is closed, the condyle sits nicely in the um, depression in the jawbone. So it sits um, in one straight line. Now on the image on the right, when our mouths are open, the condyle slides forward to touch the articular tubercle. As we can see that the condyle has moved in front. The reason why the um, Jane faces temporal mandibular joint pain is because the condyle presses into the depression in the jawbone against the intraarticular disc. Jane also experiences clicking and popping sounds because her intraarticular disc is being displaced. On first intraoral examination inside the mouth, the dentist uh, finds out that Jane has dental attrition on her central incisal edges, as we can see in this image on the bottom right, where her incisors um, at the edges are chipped off. So Jane also has attrition, which is a dental term for tooth wear due to tooth-to-tooth -to -tooth contact. She also has precision on further examination, which is excessive teeth grinding and jaw clenching. So looking at this diagram on the bottom left, you can see that because of precision, that is teeth grinding, it leads to attrition because excessive tooth-to-tooth -to -tooth contact will cause the length of the teeth to shrink. So the teeth get shorter. And such constant aggressive movement of her temporal mandibular joint causes pain in her joint. TMJ movement also creates an impact on the biting surfaces of her teeth. In summary, because of Jane's precision, that because she um, constantly grinds and clenches her jaw, it causes dental attrition, where there's tooth wear on the edges of the central incisors. And after a prolonged period of time, this aggressive and constant teeth grinding and jaw clenching um, exerts force and pressure on her temporal mandibular joint. That's why she would experience TMJ pain. To treat TMJ pain, the dentist will recommend Jane to have an occlusal splint made, or otherwise known as a mouth guard, that is usually worn to sleep at night. So you can see how um, otherwise known also as a night guard. So this is how a night guard would look like. 
So a nightgown is worn to prevent grinding of the teeth, so it can help to reduce um, Jane's TMJ pain. Other remedies that the dentist can also recommend to Jane would be to rest her jaw and to have a soft food diet. So it will be helpful for Jane to also eliminate habits such as um, cracking nuts that she constantly likes to do and perhaps even white yawning. So these habits can also help to alleviate her TMJ pain. For the next section, I'll be sharing on interpersonal skills. So before I go on to share about interpersonal skills, Um, let's have a poll to get some of the responses. So I would really appreciate if uh, you guys can answer the questions on the poll, which will be on your screens. Okay, so this is the subsequent question for the first question. Okay, and this will be the last question. Okay, thank you for giving your responses for the poll questions. So it seems that most of you, actually all of you are not afraid of visiting the dentist, which is um, really surprising because there are many people who are really afraid of visiting the dentist, but that's a good thing to know as well. So you guys will be um, really pleasant patients. <laughs> So looking at the responses, since all of you are not afraid of visiting the dentist, most of the reasons are because of um, patient-centered care, where the dentist focuses on the patient and puts the priority on the patient first. So to achieve patient-centered care, communication is a very important aspect. So let's say when, the dentist, um, when a patient first visits the dentist, the dentist will connect and build rapport with the patient through casual conversation, so through this, this can help to build trust between both the patient and the dentist. After the patient is comfortable and feels settled, the dentist can lie the patient back on the dental chair and also start to examine the patient's uh, mouth and find out about any dental problems the patient may have. So this is when the dentist will then reach a diagnosis. For example, in this case, let's say the patient has toothache. Next, the dentist will then share and explain clinical findings that he has found to the patient and to check that the patient has fully understood everything explained. This is also the time where the patients can ask questions to clarify any doubts uh, he may have with the dentist. The dentist has to really take note that he uses simple language and also visual aids perhaps to explain the dental problem to the patient. So looking at this uh, image on the top, this is an infographic where dentists can use to explain, for, for example, in this case, where a buildup of plaque um, in the patient's teeth, which is this yellowish film, which is actually bacterial, would cause decay on the patient's teeth. 
So with this decay, after a long period of time, with um, no dental treatment attended to, uh, this will cause toothache or pain in the patient's teeth. It is also important that the dentist provides the patient with uh, sufficient information and good oral hygiene tips about his oral health. The dentist should recommend the patient to brush his teeth twice a day, floss his teeth once a day, and also to have regular dental visits every six months for cleaning. Lastly, the dentist will then intervene and discuss treatment plans with the patient, um, along with the alternatives in this case, which would be extraction or conservation of the patient's teeth. In this patient case, there will be three treatment options that are available for him. So I'll be sharing more about the treatment options with respect to the images on the right, from the top to the bottom. And I'll also use my um, pointer to go along as I explain for that particular treatment option. The first treatment option that the patient can consider would just be solely extraction. The second treatment option would be extraction followed by an implant surgery, which is when a screw and an, um, and an artificial tooth is placed into the patient's gums. The third treatment option will be a root canal treatment followed by a crown. This is when the infected tissue and bacteria are removed from the patient's tooth, which will then uh, cause the tooth to be so-called dead, and then a crown will be placed on top thereafter. So aside from having treatment options available for the patient, the dentist also has to listen to the patient to find out what his needs and concerns are, and then tailor the treatment plan according to them. So these are some of the concerns and needs a patient might have. For example, if the patient is concerned about the pain, the dentist will reassure the patient that he will definitely relieve the patient's pain and also inform the patient that they will administer local anesthesia before dental treatments. So this will help to numb the patient's teeth and so that he will feel less pain. If the patient has phobia or anxiety, for example, of dental drills, dentists can um, recommend or offer the patient to have a blindfold placed on them so that he will not be able to see the dental drills during the dental treatment. So this can help to ease his anxiety as well. If the patient is concerned with the financial cost of the treatment, then the dentist would uh, recommend the patient that extraction would be the cheapest and the most viable option in his case. As for the side effects and risk of treatment, um, implant would be more risky because it depends on the suitability and the strength of the patient's bone to see if an artificial tooth would be suitable to be placed in his gums. And if the patient is concerned with aesthetic reasons, then extraction wouldn't be a um, viable option and the patient should perhaps opt for implant surgery or a root canal followed by a crown. So all in all, this um, process requires a shared decision making where the patient and the dentist work together so as to provide the patient with the best treatment outcome. The dentist will also have to respect the patient's final decision as it is ultimately the patient's choice in the treatment plan. Most of the skills involved would seem to be verbal communication. However, it is also very important to take note that nonverbal communication skills such as listening skills and the value of empathy are also essential in helping to ensure that patient-centered care can be achieved for the patient. Another essential interpersonal skill would be teamwork because teamwork is the backbone of effective communication and it also helps to initiate communication in the dental team. So typically, a dental team consists of the dentist and the dental nurse, which is where the term four-handed dentistry has come about because there, are, there will be two pairs of hands working on the patient, as we can see from this image on the bottom right. Teamwork is also based on mutual respect and trust, where members of the dental team have to um, be aware that 
each of each of the uh, members know what they're doing and will also be able to help one another and give feedback if they are unsure of anything or if necessary to clarify anything. The focus should always be on the patient. So for example, during an extraction, the dentist may be busy with the dental tools and instruments, but they can provide verbal reassurance that they will help to relieve the patient's pain and make the treatment as least painful as possible. Whereas, say, the dental assistant at the site may be able to provide the patient with a stress ball. So even though both members are handling different tasks, but they are both focused on the patient and helping to calm the anxious patient down through different ways. Members of the dental team have, have to also set aside their individual differences and realign their personal priorities to meet the patient goals. So for example, to provide the patient with the best treatment experience. The dentist and the dental assistant in the team will also have to be able to reflect on failures and mistakes together and also celebrate successes as a team so that they'll be able to move forward together. Not only that, they will also have to acknowledge one another's strengths and weakness and to give credit and also help each other to improve in their area or weaknesses uh, when necessary. So for my experience as a dental student studying in UK, I would definitely say that it is truly a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So in year one, I had um, the experience for both science and clinical modules that took place in lecture theatres, um, the science laboratories, and also clinical settings such as the Bristol Dental Hospital. I also had opportunities to socialise with my friends and classmates through activities organised by the dental school. So I really had a very enjoyable experience studying overseas. So I'll now touch a bit on dentistry application. So for the entry requirements, it consists of two parts. One is the UCAT, the University Clinical Aptitude Test, and the other one is the Multiple Mini Interview, the MMI. For the UCAT, there's no cutoff score, for Bristol and they do not take into account the scores for the situational judgment subsection. And I've also included the links for practice tests and also test statistics where you can compare your test scores and in relation to other candidates. For the multiple mini interview during my year in 2019, um, I had eight stations and one rest station. So the topics of the station range from ethics to qualities and skills of a good dentist, to my passion for dentistry, and also manual dexterity. I would say that manual dexterity, uh, if there's such a station in the subsequent years to come, is something that you can practice on, so you can find activities that mainly uses your hands that you can practice. And why I highlighted why dentistry? Because it is really very important that um, you know your passion and your reason for choosing dentistry because it is surely a question that will be asked during the interviews. So make sure you find out why um, you really want to pursue dentistry as your future career. The other aspect that would be required to apply for dentistry ideally would be work experience. And for Bristol, um, the requirement is a minimum of two weeks work experience. It would be better if you can have it in the dental environment, but uh, if otherwise, volunteering in a healthcare environment is also possible because the skills and the qualities that you will learn would be similar for that a dentist would need to possess. Personally, for me, I had my work experience in a private dental clinic and also a job shadowing at Tan Tok Seng Hospital in Singapore. So work experience would um, definitely help to boost your application and also help for the topics that you can discuss during your multiple mini interview. But aside from that, it is also a really um, valuable opportunity for you to gain more insight into dentistry and learn from the dentist where you shadow or do your work experience at to find out if it's something that you really want to do in future. And you can definitely ask, and you can definitely also ask about 
um, the work that they do so they can get greater insight and you can also have kind of a head start of the topics and also the um, content and material that they do. As for tips for the interviews, I would say to be yourself and to be calm, which is something that I wouldn't think would be easy, definitely, because back when during my interview, I also definitely felt nervous at some point in time before my interviews. But it is really um, good if you could just be yourself so that you can really present your best self during the interview. And you also would have to be honest with the interviewers because sometimes when you have some questions that you're not really sure of, um, it's better not it's better to just tell them that you don't know than to say and or to give like false answers because the interviewers are experienced and they will know if you are not giving answers that are true. Um, like factually true. As for work experience, um, so it is very important to ask questions and it's definitely highly recommended. So that yeah, as I've mentioned previously, so you can gain a greater insight into dentistry. So work experience is a, will be a really good opportunity if you guys can find. I've also included the A-level and IB requirements, tuition fees, and also the intake. And if you'd like to find out more information about dentistry at Bristol, you can uh, click on this link as well after the lecture. If you have any further questions, um, you may contact the international office, uh, Southeast Asia's one. So I've also included their contact details here. So thank you for taking the time to attend this lecture. And I really hope that you guys enjoy it as much as I did sharing with all of you. So now let's uh, go on to the question and answer session. Thanks very much, Lee, and that was so informative. I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope uh, someday, Leon, that you can fix my teeth, because I think you know lots of stuff about it already. Um, okay, so let's move on to some Q&A. Um, we've got a question from one of the attendees about uh, volunteering work. Can it be part of work experience, which uh, Leon mentioned it can? And with COVID, how can traditional work experience be replaced? Um, so, Maybe I can answer this one and Leon, if you have anything to add, feel free to um, after. So yeah, sure. experience, with the work experience, the university is quite flexible. Um, although we recommend that you have a uh, dentistry work experience, in this environment, obviously, it won't be as easy to, to work anywhere. So we'll look at any kind of work experience that you have. If it's, um, if it's in a restaurant or supermarket or something unrelated, we just want to know how those skills that you developed in the, in the work, in the job that you've done, relate to dentistry. So we have had in the past, maybe more so for medicine, students who've worked in, my, in McDonald's who talk about how uh, they learned how to deal with difficult clients or with uh, you know, the unpleasant parts of a job um, by working in, in a fast food restaurant. So those, those things can count for you. Um, but if you can find anything, like any amount of work experience um, that is directly related to, to dentistry, even if it's not the full two weeks, I think it will show initiative that you, that you tried to, um, you tried against all odds to find experience in, in a relevant field. But just know that even if it's if just for this year, if it's not um, in a relevant field, we still might be able to accept it. Um, just try and get as much work experience as you can really. Um, as Ian said, it helps you figure out the, if the field is, is right for you. Um, so, um, and someone else wanted to know um, what, oh, sorry, Liam, did you have to add anything? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, for work experience, I think in with regards to dentistry specifically, because it will be quite difficult to have work experience right now because of COVID. So maybe um, because I'm not really that sure about how admissions will work this year because of COVID, but I think it might be a better idea if not to have a longer term work experience, but maybe just a, short, a job shadowing if um, the participants are able to find, let's say maybe for a week. So that they might be able to accommodate just for a short-term uh, work experience or like, yeah, job shadowing, yeah. 
And if you can find a mentor who's a dentist, um, so someone who ne doesn't necessarily let you work in their practice, but um, that you meet up with or you have virtual meetings with every once in a while, it won't technically be work experience, but it will be some amount of like experience. Um, yeah. Try you like this year will definitely be more flexible with the work experience requirement because we are aware that um, it won't be very easy to get. Hope, that's, hope that answers your question. Um, the other question we got was around working in the UK with a Bristol dental degree. So do many international students um, work in the UK after graduation? Uh, Leon, do you want to, do you have anything to uh, say about that? Yeah, I can share about that. Um, as for do many students work, I think that's a balance. So some of them return to their home countries and some also decide to work as dentists in the UK. So if they would like to work as dentists in the UK, after graduation, they have to serve one year of the dental foundation training. So yeah, it was used to be called the vocational training, but now it's called BFT. And during that one year, you'll be attached to a clinic. So you'll have supervisors that will be supervising you. And after that one year, you will then be able to gain your that, uh, dental license from the General Dental Council and then you'll be able to work as a fully licensed dentist. Okay, very doable. Um, okay, well, um, if anyone's got any other questions, you can post them in the, in the Q&A section now. It's a great opportunity to ask us about anything related to dentistry in the UK and specifically in Bristol. Um, so if you've got a question, feel free to post it now. Otherwise, um, you can contact us using the contact details provided. That's um, sea-office at bristol.ac.uk. Um, maybe one last thing before we, oh no, we've got a question. Oh, good one. What made you choose dentistry over medicine? Leon? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, during my polytechnic days, because of um, the diploma that I did, which was biomedical science, so I was introduced to the um, science and like diagnostic work, lab work behind. So it's more like the behind the scenes work. And that enabled me to de develop my interest in medicine. But after a while, I realized that um, I'm really interested in medicine, but I chose not to do it as a career because it is quite general. And I would say also more time consuming in terms of um, the studies. Not that dentistry is less stressful or less time consuming, but as a career after graduating and working, I think dentistry is a more financially stable career and it also, it's also more flexible in terms of work-life balance, especially like to juggle between family or other commitments that you may have in life. So that's why I decided to do dentistry and not medicine. That's a very good point because also uh, dentists are rarely on call, I believe, whereas doctors yeah. might have to be. Yeah. Um, so if there are no more questions, I'm, we might end on, the, on this note. Leon, do you have any parting advice for these prospective dental applicants, dentistry applicants? As someone mm -hmm. who process uh, over two years ago now? Um, I would say that I think times now will be more difficult because of COVID, but don't let that um, discourage you from getting experience as well because um, yeah, you'll still be able to find, so don't lose hope and uh, find out about why you really want to choose dentistry and so if that's really what uh, your passion and your passion lies in, so just go ahead and don't give up in pursuing your career and to apply for dentistry, yeah. Wise words. Okay, well, thank you very much, Leon, and thanks everyone for participating. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to get in touch with the Southeast Asia office. We hope you enjoyed being part of our student lecture series and um, hopefully see you again in the future. Thank you and good night. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.